graduate schools are ready, we're extremely fortunate to be able to offer to our prospective students 16 such minor programs to choose from. Each of these, we hope, would enable the learners to fashion themselves as uniquely positioned practitioners with multiple sets of skills that they are prepared to be. A further way which the principals of the schools manifest themselves in our programs is the design studio itself, that central space which is at the heart of any design education. After the foundation year, which is common to both programs, learners in the JSA would not need to follow a preset path to the design studio. We intend to offer them multiple, multiple thematically arranged studios that would enable learners to stretch themselves along multiple lines, as a, also along multiple lines of design inquiry. What is more, the programs are also structured to allow vertical integrations of these studios in which learners at different stages of maturity can actually come together, learn from each other, collaborating as peers with faculty who, we, as we mentioned earlier, are the first amongst learners. Our hope is that taken together, these kind of structural relations, and there are many more, I would request you to please go through the brochure, along with the ideas that we have presented today, will help us achieve what is surely our unspoken aim to become one of the foremost centers of learning in the world, which will produce a paradigmatic shift in the making and the discourse about the great environment globally. Thank you. Thank you, Jolly. That was really uh, interesting uh, overview of what we are all working on together for the school. Uh, so this is the end of our first panel, and I thank all the four speakers. And now we will proceed on to the second one, uh, second panel, and I invite the four panelists along with uh, Sonova Zedi, who is another faculty in our school. Uh, she will be moderating the second panel. Thank you. architecture, the affective lives of the built environment. And I'd like to call the panelists on stage. Uh, uh, and I will continue giving uh, introduction to each of the panelists as they come now. So the first is Dr. Annapurna Garimala. And she's actually come down from Goa for this. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Annapurna Garimala, Garimala is a Delhi-based designer and art historian. She heads Jackfruit Research and Design, an organization with a specialized portfolio of design, research, and curation. Jackfruit's recent curatorial projects include Vernacular in the Contemporary at the Devi Art Foundation, uh, Tate Manuparek in Banaras at Art India, and Utable Ceramic and Clay Art in India since 1947, possibly one of the first big uh, ceramic exhibition held in India at the Perimal Museum of Art. She is also currently involved in setting up uh, and ideating about the Barefoot College of Crafts in Goa uh, with the Serendipity Arts Festival. She has authored innumerable books, uh, I'm not saying all of them. And in 2017, she was, she was awarded the India Today Emerging Curator of the Year Award. Thank you, Anapurna. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Gopali. Gopali Gupte is an architect and urbanist uh, based in Bombay. So another person who is coming from Bombay. Uh, she is an associate professor at the School of Environment and Architecture, which is also a school she uh, was part of setting up. Her work often crosses disciplinary boundaries, yet focusing on architecture and the built environment 
cultural aspects of urban economy and property, tactical practices, housing, and urban form. In 2003, she founded Critical uh, Collective Research Initiatives Trust, and in 2013, um, 10 years later, she founded the School of Environment and Architecture in Bombay. She is also a curator, an architect, an artist, and uh, her current uh, uh, curation work was this, one of the biggest architectural exhibitions ever held in India at Jawahar Kala uh, called Venice Space. Uh, she was also involved in uh, uh, the setting up the Shanghai Biennale and her installation work called Transactional Objects was shown at the 56th Venice Art Biennale. Uh, next, uh, I would like to invite Professor A.G.K. Menon. Oh, thank you. Uh, Professor A.G.K. Menon is an architect, urban planner, and conservation consultant practicing in De uh, Delhi for over 40 years. He has been simultaneously teaching in Delhi and in 1990 co founded the TVP School of Habitat Studies Delhi, now Architecture School of Indraprastha University. He has been actively involved in urban conservation and in 2004 drafted the Intact Charter for the Conservation of Unprotected Architectural Heritage and Sites in India. In the past, he has been associated with the formulation of the Delhi Master Plan 2021 and as a member of several statutory committees. In addition to his professional consultancy work, he was until recently the convener of Intact's Delhi Chapter. Thank you, Professor Ellen. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Professor Anuradha Yasadiki, who has uh, come in from Colombo and New York and many global locations, I would say. Uh, she's an architectural historian and a postdoctoral fellow in the Mahindra Humanity Center at Howard. And she joins the faculty of Bernard College, Columbia University in July 2018. Her research stems from two book projects, Monuments of Humanitarianism, Architecture and the History of the Dadaab uh, Refugee Camps and vocal instruments, Mene de Silva, and in Asian Modern Architecture. She has published widely and <clears throat> received her PhD in the History of Art and Archaeology from the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University. She has practiced as an architect uh, in Bangalore and New York. And uh, the last person I'd like to invite is Professor Yasmin Arif, who was also somebody I studied under at the University of Vietnam. Professor Yasmin Arif is an associate professor in sociology at the Delhi School of Economics, University of Delhi. Her doctoral work has been about post war recovery in Beirut and Lebanon. Her recent book, Life Emergent The Social and the Afterlives of Violence, under the University of Minnesota Press, explores the politics of life across multiple global traditions of mass violence. Uh, she is also working on a forthcoming manuscript called The Unusual Urban Cities in Conversation. Uh, which compiles all her work across different cities in the world. She uh, has held positions at the University of Minnesota, uh, the Graduate Institute Geneva, CSDS, and the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. Uh, she has received the awards of the Mellon Foundation, Ford Foundation, Fulbright Nehru Fellowships, amongst many others. Uh, her research interests are international law, humanitarianism, philosophy, and epistemology. Uh, thank you all for coming today. And I'm not going to introduce Thomas again. Uh, okay. So, this so we're going to start this session now, and I'm going to start with a small passage uh, about uh, what we meant by uh, thinking about when is architecture and the affective lives of the built environment. Is architecture the making of a clay pot, a brick, a tile, or is it the making of a kitchen, a spice rack? A parking lot, or is it the making of a playground? Is it the velocity of an overnight built glass facade corporate tower, or is it the simmering slow flame of a refugee colony? When is architecture? I would like to ask again. How does architecture happen in the everyday? In the practices of making, mending, arranging of shelves and lights, of scrounging for leftover blue tarpaulin sheets between sand mafias and bulldozer lobbies. Is architecture located between home loans, air conditioner advertisements, and DDA apartments for the heteronormative life of Indian families, or does it actually emerge in the split up households of the Hindu Succession Act of 1955? 
Our houses made of thatch and cement, steel, mud, brick, or are they arranged as a set of windows, book racks, sunlight, or memories? Is architecture about survival or is it about aspirations? As Aga Shahid Ali, a famous poet, said, rooms are never finished. When do we start actually to stop building, dwelling, and making this life and its big environments? In today's discussion, we aim to approach architecture then as a field, a practice, a way of thinking, working, and making that navigates the terrains of frantic urbanization, vernacular built environments, resource frugality, poverty, bureaucratic forms of design, national assertions, and architectural aspirations. They move from thinking about architecture pedagogies to forms of making to forms of living. Many of the questions will remain unresolved and many of the answers hope to answer themselves. So first I'd like to invite uh, Anapona uh, to start this presentation. The first uh, three presenters will be Anapona, Rupali and Professor Menon. Uh, and they will talk about their work about setting up uh, new schools and pedagogies on architecture and all the work that they have done uh, on the ideas of making and how it informs the field of architecture. begin by saying uh, thank you to Sarubar and to many colleagues here um, and as well as in the audience for taking the time to raise a question and start a conversation. So I'm a little confused after the first panel of what to say. So I think I'll just be myself and if it sets a little bonfire here and a little bonfire there, we're all grown up enough and we'll deal with it. Okay, so first of all, um, I am an art historian who trained in art history and architectural history, and I come from a design background, and my PhD was um, in a field that is not anywhere in your curriculum. It doesn't fall under the heritage category because very often heritage is history without politics. And uh, the kind of work that I did is deeply political because it was about the Vijayanagara Empire and looking at what the act of renovation did to make a place, to make a society, to make craft, to make uh, buildings, to make a landscape, to make a cultural formation. And then after that, I've been kind of continuing that work on late medieval India, or what some would like to call early modern India, and continuing to work with a, a very global, well, not the word global, I won't use that word because it wasn't used that way then, but um, a, a word like international might be useful. So you might hear Anuradha talk about it a little bit in her presentation, but the foundation of MARG, which originally started up as modern architects research group, and then within a year flipped to also become uh, marg, the Sanskrit word for path. So this kind of dual existence, uh, kind of transactional relationship between the classical local and the international modern was moving between the two for quite some time. And it was very deeply involved in, let's say, thinking about the formation of India's first post-World War II after independence art history program. Uh, Mudra Janan, the founder of the, the, uh, uh, the journal, along with a group of other people, including Manette da Silva, um, were, uh, were very keen to think about things like what will happen when New Bombay happens? What are the, what, what are the possibilities there? And um, when the state of Haryana where Opi Jindal is located. 
I feel very fortunate to have read every single piece of paper in the book I've done archived, including the letters from the Chief Minister of Haryana when it was formed, to say, we need a mark issue dedicated to Haryana. Right? Because we cannot be a proper state without a journal dedicated to us. Right? So in that magazine, the first thing that they focus on is the very fields in which this university is built on. So it wasn't nothing. It wasn't barren. It wasn't sandy. It was a place where people worked and made food and ate. And I feel deeply strongly about that. So for us to call it a wasteland is to follow in a history that started in England, let's take it place in England, when commons were turned into private estate by doing exactly what we're doing as a nation, is to declare them wasteland or uninhabited lands or empty lands or lands between histories land between nalas and railway tracks, right? So I feel that's something we really need to think about. Now, once that was done, it got picked up in India. Right now, if we look anywhere in India, it is the Gomale, the Charaga, the grazing lands which are under attack as the Kadua rate tells us, right? So let's be really clear at what's stake here. Let's be really, really clear. Because if we're going to be international, first we have to be human. OK? So I feel very strongly about this. And thank you for inviting me to say this. And I feel I have to respond because I respect what you said. And I listen to it very, very seriously. So now let me begin by turning your attention to one instance where something was made where land was not fully built up, but it was occupied. Purpose was given to it. It was probably a grazing land. But after 1947, when the city of Bangalore started growing, the city had to expand beyond its um, medieval boundaries. So a place called Jainada was invented. And that place was Asia's largest land development. It had housing for every category. It had housing for Hindus and Muslims planned into it. It had house forms for LIC employees of class C and D to large plots of land for growing Brahmin industrialists and uh, trading community industrialists. So this was the largest um, planned community in India. So why I bring this to your attention, I'm going to go through the slides really fast, is because you can build a school to promote a certain kind of thinking. And in my case, I'm engaged with that very complex word called vernacular, which is, as if, you, if any of you know that word, it has a, it has a kind of awkward history. It was like a word that was in Latin means the language of the slaves, you know, anything to do with the slaves. But I'm, I'm into those kind of words that are messy. And they make us think about power relationship just by the word vernacular. Right? So I love those kind of words. So that word is then uh, really useful in thinking about a place which I'm going to talk about. But that spending 16 years with that place has taught me a lot about how to learn more about the lived experiences of human life in a place called India, and in many places which make up this place called India. So architecture is when, I flipped it around, thank you Sarovar for letting me do that, to say when time, memory, fear, and aspiration become visible in space. You could change those words around. You could put other things in there, like um, money, or you could put in words like um, corruption. You can put in lots of different kinds of words there, but they all work. So I'll start here. So I'm going to talk about a park in Bangalore, and I think you can see it better than I can on the screen because for some reason my glasses are not wearing glasses. Okay, so um, there are three parks. One is Coven Park, 
which was started in the 19th century by Mark Hubbin. It's one of the most beautiful parks being built up by the minute, uh, full of amazing trees. And was the middle part of India, so you can grow almost any kind of tree in the world there and then move it anywhere else. Another park I, I want to bring to your attention is Makalakuta, which is a children's park that was based on Jawaharlal ne Nehru's idea of um, children's parks or children's places called Bal Bhavans. And then the one I'm really focusing is on Lachman Rao Park, who was a corporator who built this amazing park, which you see in blown up form on the side there. Um, and why I'm showing this to you is within the 16 year period, if you look at the very bottom, which is the south end, you see the BJP Abhay Ganesha Temple, it was started uh, along just after the Congress Ganesha Temple was started on the left side, uh, on the west side. You'll see a, a mosque, you'll see a Ganesh Resurgent tank in an old lake, and then you'll see a badminton court. And I'm going to show you all the pictures. And if you feel like, so this is what the tree street looked like when it was made. Uh, it was designed to look like this on bear land in Mr. Rao's mind. So he wanted all these African rain trees planted so there was this unbelievable shade on this very wide road, which it now holds at the center of its veins, the metro. Very soon, this um, Swayampu, self-born, autochthonous Ganesha, gave Udbhava, or rose up under a tree that was somewhere in 1996 when I started living in the area. And over a period of 20 years, this kind of cage-like temple has emerged. And the park, uh, and the god now, um, is like dressed in very different kinds of costumes for Google Maps, right? So he's dressed in the abundance of fruit and the abundance of coinage. And the park itself has acquired the children's park. Children are very important because, like all of us, we're involved in anything aspirational in India. We focus our energies on the largest demographic in the country, right? So here are the three corporators and the film star, Rajkumar, at the center. And there, there are three different kind of things happening. There is the evocation of rural life. So even in the heart of this urban space, we still want the farmer. We still want the village, even if they're the ruling deities or maybe forgotten deities. And then there is the pathway, which is paved for the old people whose children have migrated to the United States. And the kids have told them, here are a pair of Reeboks, mom and dad. Please exercise the comrade around to take care of you. And then there is the uh, children's play park, which is completely assembled rapidly out of fiber class. And it's for, uh, it's for play as much as for policing children, right? And then there's the park next to it, which never got developed because it's a Janta Dal park. And it's the wasteland in that sense, still, <coughs> the wasteland within the park. It holds it. And that's where the only place for boys get to be something else besides to use the Turkish phrase, to be something without dogs, to be something more than dogs without collars. So they get to play there, right? And then, and also there is a small made up gym, Gayam Shali, and there's a metro that courses above it, kind of creating a new horizon so that the, the park has a kind of parentheses between the street and the metro. There is the playground that's in front of the mosque, which no party can identify with. And it's built, it's under landscaped, and it's there. And then there's a, the new personal monument invented by the BJP corporator to the film star Rajkumar, where all of history is Rajkumar in every one of his roles, or imaginary the roles that he should have played, according to this corporator. So here's, he is as the Mysore King Mathan uh, Uh This is the opening, and it's using these fiberglass sculptures, new materialities, which you might be interested in, for, um, for that, that pick up the Hoysala kingship's lion symbol. There's the water issues of Karnataka in the river goddess Kaveri pouring out water from her vessel, which actually doesn't have any water. Uh, there is this very strange sculpture, which is like a Freudian nothing, or Freudian something in the middle of the park, of this weird 
figure of drinking something, which I can't really understand. It's a children's park or a history park. Why is he drinking something like that? And this weird bear that's holding a, um, a waist bin. And these strange hands that are meant to be benches and uh, are meant to hold buttocks, I think. <laughs> and there is the attempt to paint the narrative of the ecological city on the walls opposite this park. And the protesters are complaining about the trees being cut every day in our city. And then there is the badminton stadium that's been built by the corporator to make sure that the idea of recreation is there. But of course, it's painted in party colors. And then finally, the representation of time. Here, Rajkumar is not a historical king, but he's a suit-wearing person standing next to a clock that is called Ambara Jumbana, the sky-kissing clock tower. So in this sense, all the elements that make up the crazy thing of, of architecture or built environment or a place called India or a place called Jainagar in a city like Bangalore are brought here. And this kind of place has made me really think about projects like the Barefoot School of Craft in Goa. And that place that I'm inventing with a bunch of other people, including Dean de Cruz and eight other architecture students and craft people like Shalini Gaude and other kinds of people, is what to do when a place is left. After 1961, many, 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 many Goans left. And now there are many, many people moving in temporarily as second homes, or as coming as tourists, or as migrant laborers, or people like me, as part of the Serendipity Festival, are trying to find our way to what does it mean to be in Goa. And we're kind of working on finding this place. It's not that easy, making a place. It requires dedication, it requires attention, and it requires unbelievable humility. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anapurna. That was really fantastic. Uh, I would like to invite Gopal to uh, give us some presentation about the books. Um, sorry, can I just leave yes, yeah, sure. Thanks. So what I'm going to do is um, this presentation is in three parts, uh, and I'll see. I have about 15 minutes, so you can just let me know when it's 15 minutes, and I can stop the presentation. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, but the, the uh, what I want to begin with because this is a new architecture school, uh, and I'm really happy that there is uh, that there is this ambition of making the architecture course. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm too short for this, so I have to step out. You want to sit here? No, no, it's okay. I, I need to move the slide. You, you, you can sit here and I'll move it for you. Uh, I would prefer to have the control. I, I think, yeah, I will do that. I can stand here. Okay, let me move the slide. Acha, yeah. Oh, great. New technology. Okay, um, so I think one uh, important thing about the, the program is that I, what I'm really happy with hearing is that this is a um, this is multidisciplinary program, and I think this is something that is super important uh, because I really want to say that both the profession of architecture as well as the pedagogy of architecture today is in crisis, uh, and it's really something that we have to think about. Um, and what I want to do is, I want to actually begin with Yeah, 
So uh, I'll begin with um, this the, the poster of this. This is the uh, conference that uh, we just had uh, as as a kind of um, uh, the the end to this uh, uh, an exhibition that we set up recently called When is Space uh, Conversations in Contemporary Architecture. Uh, and this was the conference, this was the, the end, the, the final uh, day of the conference where we really wanted to end with this idea of futures. How do we look at the idea of architectural futures? Um, and we setting up four different ways in which we start looking at futures. We invited various people to think through uh, how, how we understand the idea uh, of the future of architecture. For example, uh, A1, uh, we understood that uh, the way many things are changing for us. The way we think of drawing has changed. The way we think of institutions today has changed. However, when we think of architectural methodologies and, and architectural practice, we are still struggling with the same methods that we uh, began with. Architectural education was uh, set up historically in India and somehow we have the same baggage of the methods that we uh, began with. And I think that is something that we really need to uh, question. The second uh, idea is the question of media. Media is changing our sense perceptions. Uh, so what is this new experience that new sense perceptions are bringing in and what is this new space uh, that we can actually imagine? Again, that is something that is beyond the radar of, of thinking in both architectural pedagogy and architectural practice. Uh, the third, I think, important uh, idea that, we, that the conference brought about is that our institutions have changed. Our institutions that we set up, the modern institutions that we set up to think of uh, of living, or think of cultural, cultural spaces uh, and life have actually changed. They, they're, they're in shambles. Um, however, again, architectural practice and pedagogy are really incompetent to, to kind of deal with these changes. So how do we really, again, work with the debris of these changes and rebuild? And I think the fourth but most important question that the conference brought about was this idea of inclusivity. You know, how do we look at the idea of inclusivity at various levels? And I'm really happy to see that on this panel we have this majority of women, uh, and, <laughs> and that's something that is really it's striking. Course, by the way, yeah. 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 Thanks, thanks to Saru over here. Sorry, um, sorry, like the token <laughs> But you know, I think really that's something that is very important for us to think about because when we look at architecture courses in the program itself, you have more than sometimes more than seventy percent women. But what happens to the women when they come in when, when the profession takes over? There are very very there are a handful of women who are actually leading practices, and I think the same goes with you know the the discipline of architecture and the engagement with society. I think it's only 1% of, uh, of the population that actually can afford an architect. Right? So how, how do we really look at this, the idea of engagement beyond that 1%? And then what are our methods of working? And I think the third one, which is something that we are really grappling with ourselves uh, in this new, in the, we, we also, we are a group of architects, eight of us who set up this architect school. Uh, it's not as big as this university. It is a really small, uh, almost like a cooperative. Um, set up by architects putting together our own savings. Uh, but this is really a question that one is really working with. There are new students, there are diverse kinds of students who are coming in to study. What are our methods of, what are, what are our pedagogical methods, right? Are those pedagogical methods that we've inherited enough to deal with this diversity? On the other hand, I think what is really interesting is that this is really also a resource for us, right? The diversity is something that can really help to shake up that foundation, that really heavy, uh, almost kind of principled foundation that we built in both architectural education and practice. How does the diversity come back and help us re theorize the ideas of architects in space um, and really kind of come up with new work, ways of working? So I think this was the this was the kind of four questions that we really began with, um, and then I want to just show perhaps some experiments in the school. It's it's probably not uh, enough time to show all of that. But the first experiment that we actually worked with is the way we restructure the whole course. So you don't run through uh, eight or nine courses that the university has stipulated all at the same time. We are you know, running the P one course with the other, uh, but we treat 
the course as a series of events. Intensities change. So, for example, there, a course might have the intensity out of technological dealings. There might be courses that really work with the idea of spatial uh, uh, questions. There will be a course that really talks about the craft of thinking and making and writing. And so there are intensities, but at one time you are doing just that one thing and there's a complete mental focus on that. So it's this kind of six events that you actually take students through. Um, the second very, very important thing, and I think really uh, I, um, the first presentation really pointed out to the engagement with the field. You know, you really cannot think of the field as a tabula rasa. Uh, there are serious engagements, uh, occupancies in the field. How do we really look at that? And this is actually a drawing by uh, a first, uh, first year students uh, of a tribal village two, I mean, two hours away from Mumbai. Um, and really that's something that changed the way we thought about the idea of home. The idea of home was otherwise this particular square meter space um, that one actually thought about. But here what, what really kind of transpired was that the home was just not that one space, but it was the forest, it was the settlement, it was the river, and all of those relationships that actually formed the home. Um, and, and of course, there was also this the relationship of the temporariness of the home. So for example, uh, the, whole, the house is actually something that was built every two years. It disintegrated and was built as a part of a, of a cyclical kind of process. Uh, and that is something that the government just did not recognize. So there was, for example, the Indira Avas Yojana here, uh, which said that you know all, only when you have permanent houses, only when you're building in brick and mortar, that's when we give you the funds. So the tribals were actually very clever. So they actually took the funds, they used the, house, the money to repair the houses, which was illegal. But then they would build a little shed outside to show that the funds were actually used for that. So in some ways, what is interesting is that the ground community is not something that is uh, you know, sterile. It's, it's not something that is without agency. The people who are constantly working on the ground, how does the architect actually engage with that process uh, on the ground? And that is something, and the other uh, really important thing that this, this study also uh, brought about was that we weren't really, we found ourselves not going back uh, with an anthropological gaze on the society, but the anthropological gaze actually turned back onto ourselves. Really, for us, it was about how do we actually live our lives, right? How does one learn from things around rather than this idea of seeing the other through, this, through the gaze of the outsider? Uh, so many, many lessons learned. And then there are a series of engagements that, for example, this is a, uh, this is an archaeologist working with uh, the students. This is the way you start a history theory course, where you actually look, uh, this is the, uh, the Kameri case, we're very close to the school. But you begin not with a fact-finding uh, fact method of talking about history, but starting to look at material processes and how you actually decipher. Yeah, how is it possible to actually speculate uh, certain kinds of methods of, of living uh, through material processes? And that's really when we begin a history of the theory course. And then, of course, there's engagements with the geography, with terrain, with energy, water. So you don't call them services or water supply, but you really look at the idea of energy and water and air. Um, and then there are questions of, of type, type and typology. How do you look at uh, exist, idea of existing typologies which are embedded in certain cultural processes and how do you then kind of build with these ideas of type. Uh, this is something that, this is another uh, important question that students deal with uh, and we call them ontological questions or ontological inquiries mm. where you don't begin with building a school. You're not given the project of building a school but we ask the question what is a school? The, each of the students are actually engaged with kind of talking or thinking through the process of thinking of what a school is. So for example, this one is what is a home. So there was a what is a school, what is a home, and just last year we looked at what is an archive. Um, and so the students actually deal with these questions through the engagements on the field, engagements through texts, but also engagements through their own kind of processes of writing. Um, and this was actually uh, an installation that they made as, as the pro uh, part of the design process, which uh, they took to Kochi and the students, the Kochi students we um, And then there's their teaching through making. Um, and, and that's what the, the extended time allows you to, because you're not moving to another uh, subject at the same time. What you do is you can spend an entire day out on the field or an entire day out, feet or week out on the field. 
Um, and then the other engagement is we were making playgrounds uh, in a nearby school. Um, and then this idea of the extended classroom, right? You're not really only working with the, with the classroom within, but the, you invite the world to your classroom. Uh, so every fortnightly we have uh, talks, we have public talks uh, and all kinds of engagements. Um, this is something that we do every Friday where students engage with uh, what we call this the assembly, where the entire school comes together and discuss one particular uh, contemporary issue starting, you know, it could be from the coastal road to black magic to uh, demonetization and that's something that the entire school discusses together. Uh, and then I think rather last, I think I'm going to end here uh, with the school's experiments that one very important thing is to bring new knowledge. How do you give students the confidence of, of building new knowledge? Uh, this was a part of a course uh, where the students actually uh, looked at uh, modern architecture in Mumbai and at the end of the course when, when they were writing, they were drawing and uh, uh, they were studying these buildings, they put together a poster which is now circulating in the city. So the idea is again that there is a kind of dissemination, circulation uh, of, of knowledge that goes back into the city and comes out of the classroom. So again, this whole idea of an extended classroom, which is beyond the pedagogical space uh, of the school. Um, and okay, so okay. so what I'll do is okay, maybe I'll just uh, skip to. Um, I, uh, just, just kind of touching a little bit on our own work because that's an extension of the way we think of pedagogy in, in the school um, and the whole idea of the expanded idea of architectural practice that again the idea of the architect, the figure of the architect really does not only have to be uh, in, in the realm of making buildings, uh, even in the realm of making buildings there are various ways in which you can engage um, but um, I just very quickly touch on this. I'm not talking about what this project is, but this is something that we were, we were invited uh, by Audi Urban Future Initiatives to talk about mobility uh, of uh, mobility in the city of Mumbai. And the, what we said is that mobility is not transportation. Okay, and the future, it's, it's a future of mobility. We said future is not one. It cannot be one because there are multiple agencies which are operating, and so there are multiple futures. So what we did then is that we kind of map these uh, speculations and multiple futures and we said what we do is simply make tools for people to engage with these multiple futures. And so that was the, the kind of process of, of, of working. So I'm not going to um, close. And okay, I'll just talk about this one last that the Sarovar wanted me to. Um, and this was, this is basically uh, the uh, whole kind of theorization of cities which we say have transactional capacities. Cities have transactional capacities. So for example, if you look at a, a plan uh, where there's only one line on the map, it's actually not a single line. Just like you were saying, there are various occupancies. There are actually four layers of occupancies. And cities throw up these transactional spaces and transactional capacities to actually intervene or, or negotiate ways of living. Um, and so, let me just, so these are very, so for example, this is give you one uh, example, this is a tall space, it's a very, very tiny space. And the doors are never kept closed, they're always open. Uh, this particular thing is a transactional object, which closes at the same time the door of the cabinet, and then the door of the, of the space outside. So it's the same thing that is closing, both because it's, it's not necessary to close both at the same time all the time. So, so what we did, okay, I'm just going to skip all of this. So what we basically kind of looked at was to work with these transactional uh, spaces and talk about the idea of future. How do we look at the idea of future, which is not a utopian future out there, but one step ahead of the existing transactional uh, spaces. And then we built, and this was actually for a project at the Venice Biennale, where the uh, proposition to the world was that the future is not something out there, but step ahead of the existing transactional spaces. So for example, this is the day and night one foot shop. Okay, this is the one foot shop, which is only one foot wide, and that is something that forms property in cities. It forms property only by simple occupation. And in the night, when that shop closes, the shutter is something that occupies another space. So there's another, there's a day and night one foot shop that happens. So yeah, I mean, there's series of, of spaces. Um, 
this is okay. Let me just end with this one. That uh, this is this is this one space which is a shop, and you can find that little uh, <coughs> it touches the city only at one point. Yeah, and by touching the city at one point, it occupies very little space. <laughs> so what we did is actually we did this. We built this this poppy sphere which touches the city at three points and can be rolled away in times of rains. So I'm gonna just end there. Thank you. 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 Thank Make me participate in this new venture of uh, starting new college of architecture. What I have to say is not prepared. The fact that my colleagues had something to say, I have nothing to say. <laughs> I have only myself to present, and I just talk about a few things that perhaps that I've done as uh, my presentation. The first thought that occurs to me is that uh, much of what has been said now has been said 30 years ago. Uh, when we were starting our new school, we were saying exactly the same things. Same words, same ideas, same intent was articulated in starting a new college of architecture. Then, in fact, then we didn't record it at school of architecture because we, were, we realized that in a country like India, architecture made no sense. So we called it the school of health studies. So the whole idea was that it was a a school of studies in which the teacher and the student uh, uh, studied and one heard that earlier in uh, earlier presentations. So I have a feeling of deja vu when I uh, listen that to all these presentations. It's all been said before and they're saying it again and maybe 30 years from now your students will say the same thing again. That makes me ask the first question, where are we going and what are we doing? In a country like India, if they're going to keep on reinventing what is the uh, what 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 is our strategy? What's our game plan? So, if I might pose it to the Jindal School, if you're reinventing the wheel, what have you achieved? What will you achieve if 30 years from now another Jindal School comes up and says the same thing, say that oh, we've got to reinvent the world, you know, we did more of architecture than work, you know, our country's in a mess, everything's in a mess. We need a new school of architecture and we need to start all over again. So the point I'm making is that why do we always start all over again? Why can't we continue what has already been done and maybe take it further? Why is it that all of us are geniuses and earlier we were there were no geniuses and from now on no geniuses will come and we are the only ones who matter. Uh, can we think about it? Can the school of architecture, because we didn't have the right, uh, 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 you know, it wasn't the right moment, whatever. So I would like to sort of, I, I, I just, listening to all this, I just wondering, but what went wrong with our experiment? Is, I repeat, it's the same experiment that you are embarking on. Same. Same words, same everything, same intent, same everything. What went wrong? Why did it fail? Or indeed, I would like to say, if I might use my own metaphor, it has not failed. It continues here in Jindal. It continues maybe in future Jindals. So maybe that's what it is, that our burden as India, as a third world country, is to constantly reinvent ourselves. You know, it, it becomes a, a burden that we've got to constantly measure ourselves against someone else. Measure ourselves against what happened in the West. Measure ourselves against development. Measure ourselves against modernity. Measure ourselves against all these things. Can we please not uh, measure ourselves against anyone but start doing things what we need to do? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a, a conference and it made me think that uh, this conference was on uh, building a billion, building for a billion, billion, building for a billion. And it makes you think that we as architects in 70 years have not been able to house our people. 
Now, in 1947, 48, 49, when India and China both got free, we were in about the same situation. Poor countries, populous countries, homeless countries. <clears throat> in 30 years, 40 years, China claims, one, maybe it's a fake truth, I don't know, claims that it is house of its people. India still says that we got, it was 10 years ago, 10 million homeless, now we are saying 17 million homeless, tomorrow we will say 24 million homeless. Our homeless numbers increase. What is the professional architecture doing? What have we achieved in 70 years? With all our experiments, with all our, with all our, 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 our ideas. If our society remains homeless, what is the point of uh, schools of architecture? Who are we addressing our, uh, our pedagogy to? Is it only to compare ourselves to another model in the West or wherever? See, the whole, we are also uh, can produce great architecture. Is that the purpose of schools of architecture? Are all these studio-centered education we're going to talk about going to be compared to Harvard and Yale? Or are you going to compare yourself to the fact that we we'll house up million people? Will that be the model that you will be able to uh, able to to uh, to uh, address? So I am a bit, as I said, sorry, but I didn't have a presentation. I am a bit of like Anupurna here came became a bit angry listening to all this. Firstly, because I've heard all this before and I'm hearing it again. And why am I being called to talk about the same things? So that is one. And the second is, can we please look at our profession with the objective that it's supposed to achieve, which is make a decent human society. Not these fantastic buildings, fantastic uh, architecture, fantastic ideas. Can we please uh, uh, think of our uh, human, human uh, environment? And of course, uh, we use magic words like sustainability and all that, that's fine. And I think all that's required, climate change. Of course that's required, all that is required. All that is very much there. In fact, uh, the other day, uh, I was at, uh, you know, uh, British Women's another symposium where we said that you know we've got all these transport plans, but we've got the most <coughs> fantastic transport plan. It's, it is almost carbon neutral. It, you know, it, it's a, we walk, we bicycle. In fact, the statistics showed that over fifty percent of people in India walk or cycle to work. What could be better? What could be better? And yet we are we're getting all these uh, plans to say that we got to use the exchange to what? <coughs> to introduce cars, and I think someone mentioned that uh, buses are also polluted. They're also, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, there were problems. So can we then think of the paradigm in which uh, our uh, cities, we can bicycle and walk to work, and not have these fantastic cities that are Singapore or Shanghai or or smart. Or smart. And uh, because we have many things already sorted out. It's just that we are throwing it away. For what? I don't know. But we're just throwing it away. And similarly, it happens with all countries, it happens with architecture, it happens with urban planning. And in the last few years, I've been involved in conservation, and I find that in conservation also, we had for a thousand years a wonderful uh, uh, conservation practice, how we looked after our monuments. Now we suddenly want UNESCO and ECOMOS to tell us how to conserve our buildings. Which is, in what way? What happens to the way we were conserving our buildings anyway? Why is it that we can't look at it, uh, that why can't our schools or architecture uh, 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 teach those things? And when the TBB started, all these things were put together. Because we had sustainability experts, we had vernacular architecture experts, we had conservation experts. We all got together and said, let's have a school of habitat studies. But we're going to make a better habitat and let's get all these disciplines together and make a better habitat and teach in that way. So that's basically what I have to say. I have no presentation, but uh, I'm a bit wary of the, another new school coming. I think you said 300. The figures I heard was only maybe, maybe 500. So what are the standard schools doing? So I just end up with one thing that I'm doing, and I've stopped teaching. I've stopped doing a lot of these things. So, but I'm still involved in teaching. And one of the projects we are working on is 
in Goa, as a matter of fact, in the dual quality market, so where I go because I have a second home, and I go there, and they wrote me into the college, and I go there, and I was asked to look at the thesis, and I said, my God, you know, here's a thesis of all these bright students. Irrelevant. What are you trying to design? What are you trying to produce? So they said, well, what can you do? So here I've got a new project in Goa that can I motivate the students to look at architecture differently. So there starts the story once again. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nandan, for raising all the pertinent questions again. And I'm sure you've been doing this for a long time to come for many schools that we've created. So thank you very much. Um, I would now like to invite uh, Anuradha Ayur Siddiqui to give a short presentation on her work. Thanks to the um, other presenters also sitting up here and looking at the audience. And thank you for this invitation to be here. So I am incredibly jet lagged. Um, I'm the, maybe the um, farthest traveled person at the table. And I walked in and was immediately accosted by a young man in the face and tell them very clearly what they are doing and what the ethics and politics are of what they are doing. So, I um, always open up all my um, discussions of my own work by acknowledging um, my collaborators. And I would like to really acknowledge the insights, patience, and humor of many refugees and many aid workers who made it possible for me to do my work. I think today I also need to acknowledge many displaced farmers in Haryana they flatten the difference. They attempt to homogenize. They disallow solidarities that might be predicated exactly, precisely upon difference. And I think difference might be a very good thing to think about today. So, I have been thinking for a long time about feminism as the recuperation of difference. Feminism is a kind of lens upon power. It's not it's sometimes, but not always related to gender. Um, but I've been working on feminist approaches to history. And I think those kinds of approaches seek to overturn power structures in the narration of history. And they do this in many ways, sometimes very strident ways. 